Sunrise to Sunset. Well, Sunrise to Sunset is one way of calling it. You could also say you know, a day in the life of the operating system. Um, you've probably seen numerous TV shows that do so, that day in the life episode where you follow a character around the whole day. It's not quite like that, I'm afraid. This is a bit more like we're going to talk about what happens at startup, what happens at steady state for the operating system, and what happens during shutdown. Uh, and that's our you know, full day, our sunrise to sunset for the system. And realistically, right, we learned about the life cycle of a process. The operating system, not that different. It has a life cycle as well. It needs to be started, it runs, and eventually it's shut down for one reason or another. As we know, when it's running, it offers a number of services and a suite of functionality intended to make uh, it easy and safe for user programs to execute. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we start at the beginning, right? We start with the sunrise. Um, and so when it starts, let's imagine just for the sake of this, that the operating system is already installed. There is work to be done in terms of installing the operating system and you know, partitioning the hard drive and you know, getting everything set up uh, if it is a new installation, but that's outside the scope of what I want to talk about. And we're just going to focus on the actual startup procedure for an already installed operating system. We don't have to worry too much about systems that don't have permanent storage. Those did exist in the past, um, but they're not interesting and we're not going to focus on them right now. When you power on your computer, the CPU execution gets started at some predetermined location um, and it starts running the BIOS uh, basic input uh, output system, which is firmware when it's an older computer uh, and newer computers use the UEFI unified extensible firmware interface that stores boot information on disk rather than in the firmware itself. I don't want to get bogged down in the details of that either. Um, however, it's implemented, uh, the BIOS uh, or the UEFI has a boot order of devices. Uh, and the configured boot device is usually a hard drive. I mean, it could be a USB drive if you wanted, um, but it starts execution of the boot loader. Okay, what is the boot loader? Well, the boot loader is you know, the thing that loads the operating system. Um, it is a small piece of code whose purpose it is to actually start it up. This may in fact be a multi-stage process uh, involving loading a progressively larger boot program from disk, but in the end, the goal is to load the kernel of the operating system and get things going. You may have encountered this if you've ever tried to do, say, a dual boot system with, um, say, Ubuntu or some other Linux operating system. Uh, you will be presented with the bootloader. Um, in Linux, the default now is Grub, the Grand Unified Bootloader. Uh, and it will present you with a little screen where it's like, what would you like to boot? Uh, and you can kind of give it uh, your choices of, uh, do you want to boot Windows or do you want to boot something else? You get choices in this uh, bootloader. It can do some other things as well. Uh, it can verify the state of the machine if the diagnostics are okay. Um, good. Uh, I can also initialize CPU registers, um, start up device controllers, clear out memory if it needs. Whatever the bootloader does, it will eventually, however, start the kernel. Now, the bootloader itself has at least some of its initialization code located in the first block of the hard drive that is designated as the boot device. We should start at the beginning because it is, in fact, a very good place to start. Um, and only if the first block of the drive contains this information can it be used for booting. Uh, and if you don't have your boot block on your hard drive, then, well, it doesn't work, right? The computer wants to go there to start the bootloader and it doesn't find anything. And that's you know, fine. You just chose the wrong boot device, but you have to have at least one. The important thing is to get it going. Once the kernel itself is running, then it can and will start the relevant system services. And some of your system services are always started when the OS begins running. Other ones are configurable. Uh, administrator can choose whether you want to have them start on system boot up. And although these programs are started by the operating system without any direct user interaction, most processes are still user level programs and they operate like normal. They must interact with the operating system through the system call interface. 
Um, and you as a user can also request that you know, when you log in, you know, it starts your email program or something like that. That's not the kind of thing that I'm talking about here with system services and utilities. Those are user level programs started by you as the user. You just said, hey, operating system, please start these for me automatically when I sign in. That's not quite the same thing as starting the system services. Um, but the operating system tries as much as it can to run its own system services in user mode where that makes sense. It's better for security and it's better for design and it also sort of forces a certain amount of modularity between these things. So if you want to request information, um, getting it through a system call ensures that you are using the API so that the internal implementation can change as is necessary. But once they get going, they're treated as regular user programs, even though the operating system might prioritize them in scheduling and it might insist on restarting them if they die because they are important uh, services and or utilities. Okay, but booting, although in practice is fairly complicated, is conceptually somewhat simple. Uh, and then we are at steady state. Uh, and the main purpose of the operating system, much like the Cylon Centurions here, is you know, by your command. The main purpose of the operating system, as I keep saying, is not to run for its own sake, but it's there to make things work for the user level programs that are supposed to run. And our previous experience with systems programming has taught us a lot about the services that the operating system has to offer. Um, here are some examples of things that we covered in some detail in the previous course, where we asked the operating system to do these for us. Um, process and thread creation and termination, just managing processes and threads in general. Uh, we know the system call fork to create a new process. Um, we know how to create a new thread uh, using pthread library. Um, we know how to terminate them. Uh, all of those things are system calls and system calls are asking the operating systems to do something for us. We also spent a lot of time talking about inter-process communication, um, pipes, shared memory, message queues, network communication. Uh, all of those things, again, involve system calls that we've asked the operating system to help us out. Concurrency control, um, asking the operating system to use a mutex or semaphore construct to organize the uh, way that our program runs such that it runs in the correct order and without race conditions. We're going to spend some more time talking about the concurrency control implementation in an upcoming topic. Um, that was certainly one of the major uses of the operating system. Um, but maybe the most basic example that dates all the way back to your very first programming experience is based around the idea of memory locate uh, allocation when you ask the operating system to give you some memory you will need it to respond by allocating that memory putting it in some location and giving you access to it these are just examples of things that we did a lot of in the previous course or previous courses particularly around the memory allocation one and all the courses that you've written programs in uh, but the operating system does much more than just these sorts of things. The visibility of that functionality varies, right? Asking it, please create me a new thread, this is very visible. You've said uh, quite explicitly, dear operating system, would you kindly create me a new thread? And the operating system takes your request and maybe it does so, maybe it returns an error response, whatever it is, but you noticed it because you had to go out of your way to call a function that said, please create me a thread uh, and you get an outcome immediately. There are lots of operating system interactions that happen transparently, right? The operating system must check permissions whenever you ask it to open a file, but you probably don't think about it or you don't notice that a check for permissions has happened unless somehow permission is denied. Yes, opening the file was a system call and you understood that you wanted to open a file, but it wasn't necessarily obvious that it was going to interact with the uh, protection subsystem of the operating system to try to check, all right, you, given that you are user Alice and you are trying to access this file, which has permission 750, do you have the ability to open this file? Well, it depends. What user or group are you, right? All of those things happened, but you probably didn't notice. What about scheduling? We talked about scheduling actually quite a lot in, in EC252. Um, I said a lot of things um, that said, well, you know, the operating system decides whether um, the parent process or the child process continues executing. Uh, and then in a multi-core system, there's of course the possibility they both continue executing concurrently. 
after the call to fork. Um, and we talked about scheduling as if it's this mysterious external force. And in some cases, we even considered it, uh, just imagined it as malicious. Like it will try its best to schedule things in such a way that it causes the most harm to the correctness of your program. That's not really true. Later in the course, we're going to talk about scheduling. We're going to come to an understanding about how it works. Um, and it will probably seem less mysterious, but it doesn't change the fact that in practice, a program has to be written in such a way that scheduling is not within its control, except by proper use of concurrency control constructs. And there are other things uh, that aren't on here that um, are operating system services, but we don't ever really interact with them directly. Um, we may or may not have any way to know uh, what is the accounting and record keeping that the system does. Maybe just again, an aggregate summary if you're a system administrator. And that's an operating system function, but not one that we interact with directly and one that we might not generally be aware of. So here's a visual representation from the textbook um, that talks about sort of user and other system programs as this little tiny thin bar up here as if they're you know, unimportant. Um, that's obviously not true. Um, but it's not the area that we're focusing on. Uh, and then the operating system has some uh, interfaces, um, graphical user interface, um, batch commands, uh, command line interaction with a terminal. Um, but all these things go through system calls to get into the operating system kernel, which is represented as the lower blue rectangle there. Um, and inside the kernel, there are various services that are offered. Um, we have program execution, which is about how does the um, program actually run, managing its uh, actual execution. Um, we have IO operations. We're gonna come back to uh, the IO operations in one of the later topics of the course where we talk about how um, the IO subsystem is responsible for communicating with the various hardware devices and effectively speaking their language. Um, file systems um, also falls under that category of we'll talk about when we get to that unit of the course. Um, but then we have uh, communication and that is exactly what it sounds like. The communication module is really just based around the idea of if we need to communicate with another system, um, well, the kernel is responsible for that. Um, resource allocation and accounting uh, are also services that aren't necessarily super user visible, but you can usually ask about them. Um, if we poke around in task manager, say, uh, or an activity monitor in Mac OS, um, we can probably get some information about, hey, here's some stuff that, um, the system knows about executing processes. Uh, and then error detection and protection and security are pictured in the diagram as being a little bit lower down in that you usually can't interact with them too much directly, um, but they're there and they serve their purpose even if you can't, um, if you can't invoke their uh, functionality directly through a system call. And below that, of course, we have the hardware uh, and underneath the hardware, um, well, that's, you know, that's the lowest level. Okay, and as we said, at steady state, the operating system has some background tasks, whatever it needs to do. Um, but the interesting things happen as a result of a user level program asking the operating system to do that, and you know how that works. I'm not saying it's a trap, but it's a trap. So previously, we covered it from the point of view of a user program that wants to activate the kernel. Right, um, we said uh, it uh, operates on a basis of interrupts and the interesting thing is the intentional use of the trap interrupt and it's how the user program gets the operating system's attention. Um, and in a simple view of the world where it's a single threaded, uh, single CPU kind of system, uh, when the user program is running, the operating system is not, you could say the, the operating system is even sleeping. Uh, and if the program that is running needs the operating system to do something, it needs to wake up the operating system and interrupt its sleep using this trap instruction. Uh, and when the trap occurs, the interrupt handler, um, which is part of the kernel, is gonna run to deal with that request. And in that discussion, we talked about the concept of user mode and supervisor mode instructions, as well as the idea of keeping track of what mode we're currently in inside the CPU. Um, and some instructions are not available in user mode, uh, depends on your particular CPU architecture and um, what instructions are defined in it. Uh, and 
Supervisor mode is sometimes also called kernel mode because it's the mode that the kernel runs in, uh, and it allows all instructions and all operations. And as we know, even uh, simple I.O. operation, um, write to console, you know, printf, hello world, requires these privileged instructions and they involve the operating system every single time. Modern processors keep track of the mode using this hardware mode bit. Um, that was not the case for some older processors. Um, again, I don't wanna to talk too much about ancient history. Uh, you, know, or, you know, did you know in 1975, you know, processors didn't have mode bits because mode bits hadn't been invented yet. And you know, everybody wore onions on their belt because it was the fashion at the time. I mean, that's not true. Um, at least the part about the onion, but um, you know, how do you know? How do I know? I wasn't there. Um, now, some modern processors have more than two modes, but we'll just talk about uh, dual mode operation for right now. Uh, and you can see at a glance which mode the system is in. At boot up, the computer starts in kernel mode and the operating system is started and loaded, but user programs always run in user mode. The trap instruction results in this interrupt and the operating system takes over. The mode bit switches to kernel mode, uh, but it goes back to user mode before the user program resumes. Uh, and we also saw that in this diagram where we had a transition from user to uh, kernel mode uh, in which um, we had a system call. Uh, and I always give as the example, okay, like you finished writing the document and you wanna print it. Um, and so, okay, you, the user process is executing as you type in uh, the data. Uh, and when you're ready, you call print and that invokes the system call. Uh, the system call generates a trap instruction, sets the mode bit to zero, which puts it in kernel mode. The operating system will then take over um, and uh, it will take the data that's been prepared by the program for printing uh, to send that data to the printer. Um, and again, the, calling the system call like print uh, is uh, a normal, um, normal function call for your user process. Um, but inside somewhere uh, there is the call to the operating system uh, and the operating system responds, executes the thing that you asked for, an operation goes back to user mode and the program returns uh, from the system call and can carry on. Yep, the data has been sent to the printer, uh, you can go pick it up uh, or alternatively you can go be sad because the printer refuses to print your black and white document because it's run low on cyan um, and that's just how modern printers are and printers have always been difficult uh, and they don't seem to get any better with time, which is sad. We also talked about um, why user mode and kernel mode exist. Um, I, I said, you know, as Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And many of the reasons are the same as why we have user accounts and administrator accounts. The goal is to protect the system and its integrity against both errant and malicious users. Uh, and I also even gave an example where I said, okay, if program one wants to read from disk and disk is slow, program two wants to read from the same disk. Uh, if we have operating system enforcement, then the operating system forces program two to wait its turn such that program one can complete its request. Without the operating system to enforce it, it would be the responsibility of the authors of program two to check if the disk is currently in use and to wait patiently for it to become available. And that works if everybody plays nicely but without that sort of rule enforcement, somewhere, somebody somewhere uh, will do something nasty like cancel other programs read requests so it can go first in line. That's not nice. But of course it comes with um, necessarily um, a, um, comes with necessarily performance trade off. Switching from user mode to kernel mode takes time. Interrupts have a cost and the cost is non-zero even though we sometimes ignore the cost. We say the performance hit is worth it for the security and integrity benefits that it provides. And well, on that subject uh, of the motivation for dual mode operation, let's talk a little bit about policy and mechanism. Uh, or as the narration goes, uh, in the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The police uh, who, nope, <laughs> I'm screwing this up. Uh, the police who investigate the crimes and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. Uh, you would think with all the episodes of Law and Order that I've watched, I would know how to do that without getting it wrong the first time. But um, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes you get it wrong even when you know it. So there's a distinct difference in policy and mechanism. Uh, 
And policy is about what should be done and mechanism is about how policy is carried out. And ideally these are separated to some degree to provide a certain level of flexibility, right? And in the criminal justice system, you know, at least in the fictional criminal justice system of law and order, right? There's the police who like investigate the crime and they arrest the person and then the you know, district attorney's office they're responsible for the prosecution where you know, they go to court and try to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that the defendants did indeed commit the crime. Now, when we talk about policy, policy is this idea of this is what is supposed to happen um, or what will be done in a uh, you know, more optimistic scenario in which um, you know, it's not just supposed to happen, but it is actually carried out. Some policies are configurable, right? Um, and you can choose, for example, like how much does the priority of a process matter? That is a configurable policy. You can say it matters a lot. You can say it matters a little. You can say it doesn't matter at all. Why not? That's a configurable policy. Some policies are not configurable. You know, can I read files where I don't have permission to read that file? No, right? That's not configurable as a policy. There's no policy that says, you know, turn off permissions for uh, file access. What is configurable and what is not is a question of operating system design um, and it's not always that easy to make these decisions. Actually applying the policy is both design and, and implementation but for the most part operating systems tend to err on the side of having fewer configuration options. Is that because the authors know best what the user, in this case the user is a system administrator, wants and needs? Um, is it because they merely think they do? Is it because it's easier to just not give options and you know, design, <laughs> designing the thing uh, one way is easier than designing flexibility? Maybe. I mean, that's a lengthy debate to be sure, um, but I would describe it as being outside the scope of this course. From the point of view of a user program though, like policy is quite simply something that you have to deal with, but something that you have no say in. Having to follow the rules may be less convenient, but I'll say it's not optional for the user program. A program that tries to access a file that it shouldn't have access to is told no. A program that tries to access memory that uh, it does not have access to is given a segmentation fault and ceases execution. You don't get to ignore a rule that you don't like. The operating system code, however, does not have such restrictions, right? It's free to ignore policy if it wants and read freely and write freely uh, in memory. That's not always what you want, and it can mean that a bug in the operating system you know, has serious unintended consequences. Um, but, yeah, um, it doesn't really have to abide by policy if it doesn't want to. This level of access requires that the operating system is trusted by the application authors. But there's no getting around that, right? If you don't trust the operating system, would you feel comfortable logging into online banking on that system? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. The operating system does have to be um, responsible also for the you know, mechanism, that is the enforcement of policy. Um, we'll see in later topics how to enforce certain policies, things uh, like fairness in terms of CPU time, terminating a thread if it belongs, uh, if it's um, trying to access memory that belongs to someone else. All of those things are mechanism, actual implementation. We should also talk about um, switching between threads. We went into it in a little bit of detail and we actually reviewed it recently, but we didn't talk as much about when does a switch of a process happen. And I said previously that from the point of view of the application program, we could say that the process switch could happen at any time. And we tried to imagine, uh, particularly in like exam questions or examples, what would be the most inconvenient time, the one that would cause an issue. I used to like, present to you, uh, okay, here's some pseudocode that oh, here column A represents process A and column B represents process B. And I would say, does this work? And then we would stare at it for a bit, um, although in the, in the videos, maybe not as long as uh, we would have actually stared at it uh, in class because it's a little awkward for me to just sort of sit here um, while I'm recording the video and imagine that you are giving an answer 
uh, when you could just pause it and I don't have to like put two minutes of dead air for you to think about it. You could just pause it if you want some more time to think about it. And I would say, does this work? And then you would try to come up with a scenario where it's like, well, okay, if statement A1 happens and then statement A2, and then there's a process switch to process B and statement B1 happens and then B2, then in that circumstance, we have a deadlock, right? That's the kind of thing that we talked about. And we said, process switches are not within our control. They can happen at any time. And we have to write our program in such a way that nothing goes wrong if a process switch happens at any point. But now we are the operating system. The operating system does get to choose to some extent when we switch between threads or processes. That's not a trivial decision. Uh, in fact, we have a whole unit of the course um, based around the idea of how do we decide when to run what we run, uh, and that is the scheduling unit. Uh, and the scheduling unit uh, represents numerous lectures. Um, it, it is by no means trivial. But realistically, processes um, always get paused as a result of an interrupt. That interrupt may or may not result in a thread switch, right? We could handle the interrupt and then resume executing the thing that had been executing before the interrupt occurred, or we could suspend that particular execution and we could pick up a different thread and continue its execution at that point, right? And interrupts come from lots of different sources and we've seen some of them. Um, some of them are intentional voluntary invocation of a system call. It generates a trap interrupt uh, and that trap interrupt says, uh, operating system, please uh, do something for me. Other interrupts, whatever the source, result in the same thing. And while the interrupt is handled, the operating system is running, the thread that was executing before is suspended, and that's part of the reason why it might actually make it a good time to do a thread switch, because we've already done the work of suspending the currently executing thread. Does that mean we should pick something else to run? Maybe. Depends on scheduling, right? Um, so there are a few situations in which uh, a thread switch must occur. Uh, and one of them is if the currently executing thread gets blocked. There's a call to receive, you wanna pick up some data from the network and it hasn't been sent yet. Well, that was a blocking call and the process that is executing there, the thread cannot continue, right? Same thing also for reading from a file, the data might be present in the file on the disk, but it takes a significant amount of time for that data to get delivered from disk to the executing program, so it's blocked. And it can't continue executing, right? The blocking call suspends the execution of this process, this thread, because it's not ready to run. So it cannot continue executing. Another reason why a switch must occur is the termination, voluntary or otherwise, of the currently executing process or threads. If there was a call to voluntarily exit, um, well, that was a system call. Um, if it occurred as a result of something going wrong, division by zero, segmentation fault, something like that, it's an exception. The exception is itself an interrupt. So again, the currently executing process has been suspended and we can, can no longer continue executing it because you know, it's finished executing one way or another. So those are mandatory switches, right? In that case, the operating system cannot choose that thread to continue executing no matter how important it is or how much it wants to because that thread is either blocked uh, or has terminated. So it's not eligible to execute. And then there are the voluntary ones, right? Um, and um, in the voluntary ones, we have to decide, right? The operating system chooses what to switch. Um, and in that case, we would choose a new thread. Um, after the interrupt has been handled, um, the currently executing thread is suspended um, and we choose based on our scheduling routine, what thread runs next. Um, and that category covers lots of situations, including creating a new process, creating a new thread, that sort of thing. When we talk about scheduling in some more detail, we will consider things like wanting to prevent monopolization of the CPU, and we'll talk about using various mechanisms that force threads to take turns. 
One possible way to do that is a timer interrupt, where an interrupt is generated after some period of time, and that's a prompt to consider if a thread switch should occur. It's not a requirement to switch threads. There is always the possibility that after evaluating the situation, you say, you know what, I think the same thread that was executing before the interrupt should continue, but it's at least a prompt. We should think about it. We should consider carefully, right? So this idea of taking turns will be important. And at steady state, the operating system must keep track of the various resources um, that are currently existing and the ones that are currently allocated. Um, now the operating system can do this in tables or data structures. Um, we talk about them as memory tables, IO tables, file tables, process tables, all of those. We'll talk about them, uh, particularly memory and IO and files later on uh, in the course. Um, how they're managed in later topics, but they're pretty much exactly what they sound like, right? These are just places where we keep track of the state of the system. And although they are referred to as tables, there is no actual requirement that they be tables. They can really be any data structure you like. So the first of these is memory tables, and they just track the state of memory, what is free and what is in use. The operating system needs to keep certain memory for itself to do its job, such as containing process control blocks, buffers, anything like that. Um, and unlike a user process that can ask the operating system to allocate uh, and deallocate memory for it, um, it has to do this the hard way. In addition to this, the operating system has to keep track of some attributes of memory, uh, including protection rules, um, whether sections of memory are shared or not, those sorts of things need to be maintained. Because if we lose track of these, right, things don't work the way that they are supposed to work. You may have observed, incidentally, um, that if you um, double free uh, a block of memory, um, you get a, a pretty nasty sort of crash report uh, for your process. Um, it's effectively because you are messing with the state of memory from the point of view of the operating system, and it does not like that. Now, the operating system can survive this. Uh, and it usually does just fine, but it is important that the operating system's tables are kept in good shape. So when do we update them, right? Um, memory tables may need to be updated every time memory is allocated or deallocated uh, or whenever changes take place on shared memory. Process creation and destruction can also result in some significant changes to the memory being managed as well as the process itself. Yes, a new process control block needs to be created, but also the memory space for that process itself is required. Uh, and a program, when it's executing, requires you know, memory space for a global variable, stack, heap, the executable program code itself. There's a lot of management that needs to take place uh, whenever a process is uh, created or terminated. Then there's I.O. tables. I.O. tables are, again, just sort of what they sound like. Um, they keep track of the status of the various I.O. devices that are attached to the system. Um, and I.O. devices may be shared, they may be assigned to a specific process, uh, but more importantly, when there are I.O. operations in progress, it's necessary to keep track of what the operation is, where the data is coming from and going to, uh, and there may be a queue of requests for that device, uh, and we also have to keep track of that somehow. And then there are file tables. Uh, and again, we'll come back to this much later on in the course, um, but there are file and uh, file level uh, tables for process and system level. So we have to keep track of which uh, files are open at all in the system, as well as which ones are open by which process. Remember, um, the abstraction that we use in Unix is that everything is a file. So files refer to not just actual files on disk, uh, but also other constructs like uh, sockets and pipes. Uh, all those are files from our point of view. Uh, and then there is the last part of the operating system's day. Right? We've been at steady state for some period of time, uh, and then it's time to shut it down. Uh, and shutting down the operating system sounds relatively straightforward, but it might not actually be as easy as, as that, right? To do so, we should notify all running processes that they should exit. 
Sending them a signal that asks them to exit SIG term or something like that should be sufficient and ideally program authors have implemented something that makes it a graceful shutdown as opposed to each process just dying unceremoniously. No guarantees though. Because asking a program to shut down politely may not actually get it to terminate, right? This may be because they intentionally or unintentionally ignore the polite request. Now, if you're editing a document, the editor might have this little pop-up window like this one from editing the slides that says, would you like to save your changes? And this pop-up will appear on the screen actually for an indefinite period of time for the user to decide. And that is kind of sensible. If I, as a user, click the close button on the window and you know, you're asking me this and you know, my attention has gotten distracted because uh, I got an incoming call um, or um, I switched to a different um, window, I didn't really notice this, waiting an indefinite period of time for me is actually kind of sensible. But if an operating system shutdown has been called, at some point you might decide to forcibly terminate the processes even if it means the user loses some work. That's kind of a, you know, a bad thing. But you know, if an administrator called a shutdown, are we going to allow one user to hold it up because they have a Word document with unsaved changes? Does that seem reasonable? Um, another thing is how long are you willing to wait? Right? Usually we think about saving as a fairly quick operation. You know, this, this only takes a second or less, but is it? What if it's actually a much slower operation? How long are we willing to wait for processes to finish their work and you know, exit gracefully before we say, all right, we're pulling the plug on this? It is actually not a trivial decision. Um, another consideration, can every user, even those who are not administrators, request a shutdown of the system? Um, if it's a desktop system, it's probably fine. If I'm done with a computer and I want to turn it off to save power, that's sensible, right? You know, podium computers in a lecture hall um, are you know, treated like desktop computers and I can shut it down, I suppose, if I want, uh, even if the operating system doesn't really give me the ability to do that. You know, if it tells me there's no power options or whatever, like there's a big button on the front of the case uh, and I can just press that until the machine turns off. Uh, or alternatively, uh, throw the switch on the uh, power bar. That that will do the trick. Um, so yeah, in that case, maybe it is sensible for a non-administrator user like myself to shut it down. Ideally, I'll you know, save some electricity if I have the last lecture on a Friday. It might even be polite for me to shut it down. There's no reason to leave it running all weekend when it's not going to get used. Um, but if it's a multi-user server, um, probably not. Right? Um, other people will be very annoyed if I turn it off while they're using it. If I call a shutdown on EC Ubuntu you know, when students are using it to complete an assignment, um, that's probably not going to be well received, honestly. Um, and once all the user programs are terminated, the operating system can terminate its own internal services uh, and signal to the hardware to switch the machine off uh, or alternatively restart. Uh, and if we chose restart, well then, it's back to the beginning, back to step one.